In my professional life, I have the good fortune to be able to share many of the same skills I use on the homestead with people who use them to make a difference in the lives of children in schools. Recently, I taught a very short lesson on how to lash a tripod. I've heard many people ask for more details on this useful skill. It's not hard to see why. Lashing, which is joining two or more poles together with a specific type of rope work, has likely been around for millennia a skill and techniques developed and refined by indigenous peoples the world over for all kinds of uses, though mainly related to shelter and cooking. Teaching kids to lash things together provides them with a useful skill that will carry with them into adulthood. When taken as a whole, a lesson on lashing also provides the opportunity to teach other skills such as situational awareness and thoughtful harvesting that leaves nature for other people to enjoy. Situational awareness is nothing more than knowing your surroundings and the potential for things to happen in them. For instance, I'm cutting saplings along this private road, which I own and need to maintain. I therefore have permission to cut these trees, but I've also stopped and taken the time to look around and think about the possibilities for danger. Since this is a road, there may be cars that I don't want to hit me, and that I do not want to hit with a falling tree. There are also power lines above that I don't want to hit, for obvious reasons. If you're working with children, especially in a public school, you'll likely get resistance to any of them using tools like this. You may even have some of the same reservations you'd hear from teachers and administrators. While learning to use tools like this is a useful skill that teaches children humility, respect, and to be careful, you need to pick your battles in a school setting. If you cannot get permission to allow children to do the cutting, assuming of course you've already got permission to cut saplings at all, you may need to do this part ahead of time, without kids present. Also, in some locations, particularly urban sites, you may not have the option to harvest your own garden bowls. You can get some donated, or visit a local arborist or landscape management company and ask them to set aside poles they cut and would otherwise chip or burn. If you're going to be working with tools like this with children, be sure you yourself understand how the tool works, what the dangers are, what the safety precautions are, and that you have enough adult supervision, meaning a proper teacher to student ratio, to ensure proper safety. Here's some of that thoughtful situational awareness I was mentioning. Just before I dropped the tree, I checked again to make sure no cars were coming in either direction, then quickly moved the tree out of the roadway so it isn't blocking or will not damage a vehicle that does need to pass. Once you have your saplings cut, you can begin cutting them to length. While this term is often relegated to firewood lengths, any time you cut a tree into any length log, you're doing something called bucking. When you're bucking a tree into garden length poles, I recommend you ensure all the poles are the same size, at least within a couple inches, if you don't have a lot of experience lashing tripods together. It's not actually necessary for the poles to be the same length, but it will be easier if you've never done this before. In my case, I'm making these poles 7 feet long for a specific project. If you cannot get permission for your students to use a power tool, you might be able to get permission for them to use a handsaw. These are still dangerous and need to be handled with care, and any lesson in which kids use them should be well thought out and prepped. However, the nice thing about a hand tool like this is, it's human powered, meaning if it cuts a body part, the cutting stops, instantly. Unlike a power tool which, in some cases, will still be moving even after the trigger is released. Again, while there's a lot of value in this type of activity for kids, pick your battles. There's still plenty of amazing learning taking place if students show up to the garden to lash poles together and the poles are already there and felling tools never made an appearance. Another important consideration, whether you're getting saplings along a roadway, at the edge of a playground, or in the middle of the woods, always with permission no matter the location, 
is that you need to clean up. Young saplings have a lot of branches that need to be removed if you're going to be lashing them together, and those branches should not just be left where they fall. They're a tripping hazard and are unsightly, even in the woods. I've spoken before about what I do with branches and detritus in the woods. It gets piled neatly to make habitat for squirrels and other small mammals. The hope, on my homestead, is that these creatures stay in the woods beneath these piles instead of coming into the garden to eat my vegetables, and that their predators, such as fox, also stay in the woods chasing the squirrels instead of my chickens. If you don't have the option to make animal habitat piles in the woods, make sure you know what you're doing with the trimmings and detritus. In a minute, I'll give you some tips about how to use this material. It's important to remove the branches all the way down to the central trunk. I've got these incorrectly to show the problem. Here is what it should look like. No little nubs. I'll explain why later. Now let's get to the lashing. You can use any type of rope or twine to lash together poles. However, consider the use and surroundings of your lashed project. Since my lashings are all used in the garden and are almost always only going to be used for a single growing season, I use untreated sisal twine. This is a natural fiber, meaning it's renewable, and it biodegrades if you get untreated. In fact, I use this material extensively throughout the gardens and compost most of it at the end of each season. You can get small spools at any hardware store, since I use a lot, I buy mine in bulk at feed stores that market to farmers. I purchase mine in spools used in hay baling machines, which conveniently fit exactly inside a 5 gallon bucket and uncoil from the middle outward. If you're lashing a structure that isn't for the garden, something that will need to hold weight, or even people, you might want to use something heavier, such as climbing rope or clothesline. The length of rope or twine used in each lashing depends on several factors, including how many poles you're lashing together, the diameter of those poles, and how much weight your structure will support. If you're lashing a tripod for trellising climbing plants, particularly things like beans or peas, keep in mind that the biomass of fully mature plants likely weighs far more than you think it does. When in doubt, err on the side of more is better when it comes to the pole diameter and the rope length. It's possible to lash directly on the ground, but raising the end of your poles off the ground, even a few inches, will make things a lot easier. You need to be able to tie two basic knots, one to begin your lash and one to end it. Actually, you can just use the same knot, but I learned this way, so it's a decades old habit and it works. The first knot is a clove hitch. There are two ways to tie this. I'm going to show you the fast, easy way, but this only works if you can slip the loops over the end of your pole. Let's look at that again and break it down a little more slowly. To tie a clove hitch this way, you'll make two loops in the rope, both the same size and both following the same pattern, right over left. Once you have your two loops, you take the second and place it behind the first. When you're making the loops, it's right over left. When you place the loops, it's left over right, or second behind first, however you can remember it. Keeping this configuration, slip both loops over the top of one of the outside poles. It doesn't really matter which one. You can lash either way. If, as I've done here, you made the knot too far down your rope and don't want to waste so much, you can backspin the knot until you're closer to the short end. I don't recommend you mess with this until you've gained some experience. 
Instead, practice your clove hitch so you can get the loops closer to the end and smaller, remembering that taking the slack out of the loops moves the knot down the rope. Make sure you don't start at the extreme top of the poles. You want to have some of the tripod sticking up above the rope work. How far depends upon the use to which the tripod will be put. One more really important thing about a clove hitch before you start the lashing. You don't want the working end, which during the lashing work is this long end, going against the knot. It should come out of the clove hitch in the same direction that you'll be wrapping the poles. Otherwise, you basically untie your clove hitch and you'll have no anchor for your lash. A tripod is one of the simplest lashings to do. The only things you have to remember are to keep your wraps tight, don't let the rope overlap itself, meaning line the wraps up next to each other instead of letting them be on top of one another, and don't leave gaps between the wraps. The number of times you go around is dependent upon the length of rope with which you're working, which, as you'll recall, was dependent upon the use of the tripod. More is generally stronger, up to a point. It's definitely possible to have too wide a lash. This will weaken the lashing and also waste material and time. For this project, I'm going to wrap seven times, which, as you'll see later, is plenty strong enough. Once you've wrapped the poles a sufficient number of times, it's time to frap, which is admittedly a silly sounding word. Wrapping is looping your rope around the poles. Frapping is looping the rope around itself, between the poles. This is a key step because it cinches together your wraps, is how you can make the entire system tight and strong, and is a key factor in whether or not your lashing holds or fails. This is the step where it really pays off if you've cut all your branches as close to the pole as possible. Frapping is hard because if you've wrapped correctly, your poles are very close together, leaving tiny gaps to get the rope through. Having the nub of a branch anywhere in here will make frapping annoyingly difficult, if not impossible. The last step is the finishing knot, which should never be on the same pole as the starting knot, no matter what type of lashing you're doing, tripod, box, etc. As mentioned, you could just do another clove hitch, but I learned to end with a timber hitch, which is nice because, unlike a clove hitch, pulling the working end back against the knot actually tightens it. A timber hitch is essentially a repeated overhand knot. The more you repeat, the stronger the knot, but the harder to tighten. I should have left more working end here, but this'll do. Finally, it's time to erect the tripod. Normally, I do my lashing work right where the structure needs to stand. Before erecting the tripod, make sure the workspace is cleaned so you're less likely to trip. This is especially important as you get longer poles. For instance, a 12-foot tripod can be difficult to erect and you'll be looking up the poles while you're maneuvering, not down at your feet. You know your lashing is tight if it's difficult to open the tripod. While I'm sure it's possible to be too tight, I've never seen that happen. The easier it is to open, the looser your lashing is, and if it's too loose, it won't last, especially when it gets some weight on it. With two of these tripods, you can trellis an entire row of climbing plants, like tomatoes, cucumbers, peas, or beans. Or you can simply keep adding poles and make a nice bean trellis or sunflower house. Don't forget to clean up your mess. And don't forget that maple saplings, if you happen to use them, make excellent marshmallow sticks. Mm -hmm.